Well, today we'll be going back to the late Cretaceous as we sculpt this Triceratops with Montmartre make and bake polymer clay. But before we start, if you love art, then make sure you check out our webpage at www.montmartre.net because there is hundreds of free art lessons there, as well as our Facebook and our art club, The Creative Connection. So, let's get into it. I think everybody has a favourite dinosaur, and mine is the Triceratops. Before I embark on any sculpture, I study the subject fairly extensively. I found a painting in a book of a galloping Triceratops, and I thought it would be a great challenge to create the creature in this pose. So I create a drawing from my research and try to get the proportions correct. This will end up in the PDF lesson plan, and I just lay in some tone to remind me of the form when it comes to the sculpting. This stage also gives me an idea of how I will construct the armature. I couldn't find any front view reference, so I've drawn up an accurately scaled front elevation view so I can take measurements and see how it will look foreshortened. One also notices how thin the bottom region of the skull is and the mechanics of how the legs will be situated in relation to each other. Once I'm happy with all the elevations and I have nutted out the armature, I print them out, I get my hardware and I start. For this armature, I'll be using two gauge tie wire, two pairs of pliers, two booker rods, six nuts, six spring washers, six machine washers, and a drill bit, all in 3 16 gauge. A drill and a traditional wooden pallet for the base. I have created a hole template on the third image sheet. It is very important for these holes to be in the correct location. So cut it out and place it directly in the middle of the pallet. Tape it down and drill the holes as cleanly as you can. Next, take a 3 16 booker rod and separate it in the middle. One important thing to remember is booker rod will not bend past 90 degrees as it will break. Please bear this in mind when you are building your armature. Place the first rod through the appropriate hole and from the bottom place the washer, spring washer and nut. Flip over the pallet and do the same on the other side of the rod and tighten. First we'll create the front leg. This rises up with a slight bend in it at the elbow, then bends back around the breast area. So make the first bend, measure and make the second bend and then that third bend. The final fourth bend takes it back to almost horizontal. Next we create the rear right leg. This follows a similar shape, but it is set back. Take the first bend and check it with the wireframe diagram, and then make the second bend very close to the first in the opposite direction. For tight bends, pliers should be used to bolster the rod. Make the knee bend and then make that bend back horizontal. The third rod is vertical. This will support the front hoof that hovers above the base. So the first bend will be the horizontal one. So now we have three rods rising from the base, bending horizontally out at these angles. We have to remove the excess rod here, here and here. Again, ensure that the ends finish inside the perimeter line of that top view. Mark them and finish them off at the appropriate angles. Next, we have to create some reinforcement for that back right leg. Cut three lengths of tie wire and weave them tightly together. Leave some strands free and bind the wire to the end point of the left rear leg. This will be in the general area of the hip. Create the knee joint, then the joint between the tibia and the foot. Then bend that wire onto the left front leg. Ensure that the joint is situated 18 millimetres above the base. This is important, so the correct gait is suggested on our finished model. Now for the spine. Refer to the views and cut three more lengths of wire, a bit longer than required, and weave them together. 
Place them centrally on top of the horizontal rods of the armature and tightly bind them with tie wire. For the head frill or flounce, refer to the front view and fashion a length of wire to the perimeter shape. Ensure the length is long as we need to weave it in and out to create a sort of reinforcement mesh to take the clay. This needs to be fairly thin to look scale. So I've decided to add another little bit of wire to each of these horns because there won't be much clay there and they might get knocked and you want them to be as strong as possible. So that's our armature essentially finished. Find the end points off your diagrams and snip them off. Now with this, our armature is essentially finished. We just need to grab some alfoil and bulk out the body. The thing to bear in mind here is to really compact that aluminium foil. You want it to be hard and stable. Check that it fits inside the top and side profiles and then fit it into the armature. Then take a length of tie wire and tightly bind it onto the armature. Create more bulking for the tail and bind that onto the appropriate area. Finally, create more bulking for the neck too. Take it up to the head. This bulking is quite important, not just to save on clay, but aluminium is very heat stable and allows the clay to expand and or contract through the curing process. Now take some polymer clay and roll a sheet flat until it's about four mils thick. Then cut it into strips and apply it around the bulked out armature. Ensure the thickness is fairly uniform. The more uniform, the more stable it is. And it will cure consistently, providing a sound base for subsequent layers. So too it is important to ensure the joints amalgamate cleanly. Use a flat metal clay tool to do this. Now for our friends, frill. Apply a sheet to either side of the armature and press them together so the bond is good. Then cut it to shape. I find one gets a nice clean removal when a blade is used. The last stage of the armature shell is to bulk out the head. Again ensure this fits inside the profile. Well, that's the armature shell finished. We can now bake it. But before we do, take one final check with the side view that it all fits inside the outline. And if it does, bake it. Just follow the instructions on the back of the packaging for that. Now it has cured and cooled, we can start filling out our friend. This stage can be thought of as adding muscle tone and underlying bone suggestion. Any areas where our friend's bones would be noticed are better put in before we add the top sheets of clay. Like the vertebrae here, add a very thin sheet over the top and amalgamate the clay cleanly. Push and pull the clay around until you are happy. It's also a good idea to photocopy some good skeletal views to refer to. I actually studied my friend's skeleton for ages before I started. I add some rounded disc-like shapes to suggest the bottom of the belly and the lump created from the pelvic girdle. Add some on each side to suggest the apex point of the thoracic ribs, smoothing all the time. I then add some sheeting onto the tail. When one adds sheeting, it is important to ensure there is no air pockets. Air pockets create many curing problems. Constantly refer to your reference. It should be noted the Ceratopian's tail obviously got consecutively thinner toward the end, but they were not round, more elliptical. More bone suggestion by adding the tops of the pelvis or the sacrum. These would be foreseeably visible as Triceratops weighed on average as much as 10 tons. Next, apply the thigh and smooth it in so too the chest bones would be very prominent, especially in a full gallop as our reconstruction is suggesting. Triceratops front limbs were much shorter than the back legs, so there would have been a lot of sheer weight resting on the corocid and the sternum. I then suggest the scapula, which in Triceratops's case was very large. 
Incidentally, it has been suggested that it is this large swinging shoulder blade that theoretically would have enabled them to gallop. Next, I bulk in the legs. I find it easier to add more clay than I need and then subtract it as I refine. The position of Triceratops' front limbs has been the source of speculation also. Were they upright or did they sprawl? I tend to think that they would have tucked under the animal like this. It just seems more logical as all. Again, just keep refining and keep the areas of clay in for muscle. The toes will be added later, so the extremities of the legs just have to be shaped. I think the legs are the most challenging part of a sculpture like this, so I just take my time. If Triceratops was a galloper, it has been speculated he probably moved at about 45 kilometres an hour. Bearing in mind he was roughly twice the weight of a bull elephant, and the fastest gait for them is about 30 kilometres albeit a funny sort of running walk. A 10-ton creature moving at this speed must have been a magnificently intimidating spectacle. You have to wonder at the validity of him being that stereotypical arch nemesis of old T-Rex. I reckon T-Rex would have given him a wide berth. Create five toes and apply them to the shaped base. It has now been proven the three inner toes held all the weight and the other two were vestigial and didn't touch the ground. So she was probably a lot more agile and much faster than usually thought. Okay, well the body's pretty much finished and those feet look great. We'll add a little bit more detail uh, at the end, but time now for the head and I'm really excited. So let's get into it. The first thing one needs to notice is how slender the bottom of the jaw is. So create the element from the side view and apply it to the appropriate area. Smooth it in and cut a pretty finished shape. We can then start to bulk out the top of the head. Now a full grown Triceratops had a skull that was on average six to eight feet. Create that fabulous beak and give yourself more clay than needed. So you can pair it back Incidentally, paleontologists reached the conclusion that Triceratops may have been partially carnivorous, probably scavenging after predatory dinosaurs. Its strong jaw was able to crush bone and flesh as easily as they could grind plant material. Fill out the cheeks and lay a very thin sheet over the head crest area and blend it all in smoothly. Fill in the back voids at the back of the head and then shape it. When shaping, take note on how acute the beak is. When I was a kid, I had a vinyl Triceratops model that I absolutely loved. Looking back, the head was totally incorrect. It didn't matter though, because I used to pit him against an equally incorrect Allosaurus and they weren't even from the same time period. It is interesting, we humans were closer in time to the Triceratops than Triceratops was to Allosaurus. Add those horns and smooth them in. Triceratops horns were three feet long and appear to have twisted and lengthened as it aged. Suggest the orbital bone with clay and create the eyes. Take your time with them. The eyes give the model a soul. Cut in the shape of the beak and pop in a couple of nostrils. Then add a bead of clay at the join point of the horn and give it a little bit of texture with a sharp point. At this point, add some texture to the horns. This patina is important in the painting process. So stay tuned because I'll be painting our friend down the track. I like to name my dinosaurs. My Allosaurus was named Allison and one of the girls thought Sarah would be a suitable name for this one. I then detail those side horns. I then add some scales with my handy dandy scale tool. If you want more information on making this, check out the Allosaurus lesson. I found a photo of a skin impression fossil from Triceratops, and they were fairly large scales. The latest finding is that it had a series of weird fist sized bumps, with each one holding a nipple like structure. 
which has yet to be explained by scientists. These structures may have been anchoring points for porcupine-like quills. Next I add some frill ornamentation with a series of pre-cut little triangles. These were keratin and not bone and the reason for these is not totally clear but it was probably for recognition purposes between individuals. They were thought to be herding animals so this is probable. With this addition Sarah is finished. That is, apart from her nest, things like this give a sculpture a real story. Maybe she is chasing off the egg thief of a raptor. Get away from my babies! Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Don't forget to subscribe if you want and remember to keep on creating. See you next time!